It's just my opinion, but I think there's a good chance that the CIC lockout chip is one of the more esoteric and misunderstood aspects of the NES. So in this episode, I'm going to discuss why Nintendo made it, how it works, and tell the story of some pretty inventive folks who found some ways to circumvent it. CIC stands for Checking Integrated Circuit, and it's a chip that exists on every officially licensed NES game. It also exists on the motherboard for the NES itself, and when the two chips come together, they act as a sort of lock and key authentication system that Nintendo called 10NES. When you turn the NES on, the CIC chip on its motherboard, called the lock, attempts to communicate with the chip on the game board, called the key. Roughly speaking, the lock asks the key to send it some specific information, and if it doesn't get the information it's expecting, it causes the console to go into a once per second reset loop. The purpose of the system was to prevent developers from publishing games for the NES unless Nintendo explicitly allowed it. Third-party publishers could buy a license to publish games from Nintendo for a fee, and if they did, Nintendo would supply them with the CIC chips needed for their games to work. Nintendo patented 10NES and filed for a copyright for the source code used on the CIC chips. The patent has long since expired, but Nintendo still holds the copyright for the code. As such, I'm not going to show you the exact code that exists on the chips, but I'll explain to you roughly what it does and how the system as a whole operates. In order to really explore the chip and 10NES, I'm going to get into some pretty technical details. This includes talking about the electronics in and around the chips in addition to how the program code manipulates those electronics. If that's not your cup of tea, that's totally fine. I'd say just skip the technical bits when they come up and jump ahead to the parts on how the system was circumvented. Because that stuff's pretty crazy. Okay, with that out of the way, let's first take a look at some of the reasons why Nintendo would be motivated to even make the CIC chips and implement 10NES. Ask most people who are somewhat familiar with 10NES, and they'll probably describe it as an anti-copy or DRM system. Now, as a lockout system, it certainly does have that effect, making it quite hard for folks to make their own homebrew games that work with the NES. But the more I researched, I became less and less convinced that Nintendo had this use case in mind when they designed and implemented the system. The NES is a third-generation video game console, and it was preceded by iconic second-generation systems such as the Intellivision and the Atari 2600. Introduced in the late 1970s, these systems really established the home video game market in the United States. By 1983, that market had grown to over $3.2 billion of revenue, until suddenly it all came tumbling down. Often referred to as the video game crash of 1983, this event saw revenues drop to around $100 million over the course of two years. That's only like 3 or 4% of the market's peak. There were multiple causes for the crash, but one of the most readily apparent was the decided lack of quality in the games being released near the end of the boom. Probably the most famous example of a crappy game from this time was E.T. the Extraterrestrial, a game that was supposed to be based on the Steven Spielberg blockbuster, but ended up being kind of a twisted mess of pain, confusion, and anger. Things got so dire at one point that Atari took roughly 700,000 unsold games out of storage and literally buried them. No joke. There was a rumor going around for decades that Atari had done something to this effect, and just a couple years ago, a whole bunch of cartridges were found and excavated in a New Mexico landfill. So it was in this climate of absolute video game despair that Nintendo released the Famicom to Japanese audiences. And it was a huge success. While the crash was global, it was mostly felt in the United States, with sales for games in Japan and elsewhere staying relatively steady. With the wild success of the Famicom in Japan, Nintendo, of course, wanted to expand their business into North America. But the whole ecosystem in the West was so poisoned that they decided to change a few things up. The first thing that they did was to modify the cosmetics of the Famicom, making it load games from the front, like a VCR, and changing the name to the Nintendo Entertainment System. This helped distinguish it from systems that had failed during the crash, like the Atari, and probably did a lot to boost initial consumer confidence. But no matter how well the system did initially, Nintendo knew that they couldn't sustain sales unless they could somehow control the quality of the games. This meant that they had to add some sort of mechanism to the console that prevented the use of unauthorized games. Thus, the 10NES lockout system was conceived, patented, and implemented. 
In theory, since Nintendo had a patent on the 10NES system, it had legal control over who had access to the CIC chips, and you only got access to the chips if you applied to Nintendo, passed their quality control standards, and bought a license to publish games. Additionally, as part of the license agreement, Nintendo only allowed publishers to make three games a year, an obvious attempt to enforce quality over quantity. Now, whether or not the 10NES system actually resulted in higher quality games is debatable, but this was the company line. In 1986, then president of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi said, quote, Atari collapsed because they gave too much freedom to third-party developers, and the market was swamped with rubbish games. This could very well be true, but it's pretty hard to deny Nintendo's profit motives here. I mean, by the end of the 80s, they had control of over 80% of the video games market in the United States. And their anti-competitive practices, such as using the CIC lockout chip to control who could publish games, probably had something to do with that. I read an awful lot about this, but I really didn't come to any firm conclusions. Though, any way you slice it, the NES had succeeded in a very real way. The company claimed that it was their control over the quality of the games that allowed for this, and what gave them that control was the 10 NES system and the CIC chips. So while it's a somewhat hidden aspect of the system, put into context, 10 NES makes quite a bit of sense and seems kind of important. With all that in mind, let's take a look at how the system works from a more technical perspective. The 10 NES system consists of two CIC chips, the lock on the NES itself and the key on the game cartridge. The lock is responsible for coordinating and synchronizing communication between the two chips, along with determining whether or not to lock the system out. The key acts as a subordinate to the lock and provides the information needed to correctly authenticate the cartridge. Over the years, there were many versions of the CIC. This was based on whether the chip was intended for use as a lock or a key, the region for the chip, and the year it was produced, as Nintendo revised the design multiple times. Regardless of the specific model, it appears that Nintendo CICs were, for the most part, Sharp SM590 microcomputer chips, preloaded with a proprietary program ROM. The SM590 is a primitive, low-power 4-bit microcontroller meant for use in applications such as TV remotes. For the most part, the lock and the key chips are interchangeable, and their programs contain the code to run both roles. The way that the program knows which role to take is based on the value it reads from pin 4. On reset, if the CIC's program reads that pin at plus 5 volts, then it proceeds as the lock. Otherwise, if the pin is grounded, then it assumes the role of the key. As such, on the NES's motherboard, the CIC pin 4 is always tied to plus 5 volts, making it the lock, and on a game cart, it's always tied to ground, making that one the key. Pins 1 and 2 of the CIC are used by the program for data output and data input, respectively. This is how the two chips share data, with the output of the lock chip connected to the input of the key chip and vice versa. Both chips are also connected to the same 4 MHz clock source, via pin 6, which allows the chips to be fully synchronized and operate cooperatively. For both chips, pin 7 is also used as the auto-clear or reset pin. When a voltage goes high and is then brought low on this pin, it causes the chip to be reset and for the program to begin execution from the beginning of the ROM. The key chip's reset pin is connected directly to the reset switch on the NES, along with an electrolytic capacitor, which is in turn tied to plus 5 volts. This is a simple example of something called a power on reset circuit. The idea here is that the capacitor takes a certain amount of time to charge, and during that time, it connects the pin to plus 5 volts. But once fully charged, the cap no longer allows direct current to pass, and the pin's internal pull-down resistor drops it back down to ground. Basically, it's an automated way to mimic the pressing of the reset switch when you turn the power on. Upon reset, the lock chip must perform a series of initialization tasks. First, it identifies itself as the lock by reading a high voltage on pin 4, and then it calculates a 4-bit random number generator seed by incrementing a counter every few cycles until pin 3 goes from high to low. Pin 3 is usually called the seed pin, and it's connected to a capacitor in a similar way to the reset pin. Just like with the power on reset circuit, the seed capacitor will take some amount of time to fill. Once fully charged, the capacitor will cut the pin off from plus 5 volts, and the chip's internal pull-down resistor will bring it down to ground. Since capacitors are manufactured to have capacitance values within some tolerance, like 5 or 10%, this means that the seed cap for each NES will take a slightly different amount of time to charge. 
So in theory, when the CIC is calculating the seed, the number it ends up with will vary from console to console. Regardless, the idea here is that the seed cap allows the CIC to get a hold of some real randomness before the program proceeds. After generating the seed, the lock then holds the CPU and the PPU in a reset state by bringing pin 9 low. This pin is directly connected to the reset pins on those chips, and as long as it remains at a low voltage, they won't operate. At this point, the lock sends a pulse down pin 10, which is connected to the reset pin on the key, and causes that chip to be reset. As the key goes through its own somewhat simpler initialization routine, the lock runs a series of instructions that take the same amount of time to complete. Once both chips complete their respective routines, both programs enter a known and consistent state. They're now synchronized. The lock then sends the random seed it created to the key, and both chips use that seed to generate a pseudo-random binary number. Using the data lines, the chips communicate those numbers with one another, and the lock compares the result. If the two numbers are the same, then the lock releases the CPU and PPU from the reset state, allowing the game to load and play as expected. From here, the process repeats indefinitely. Both chips generate random bits, communicate them over the data lines, and then the lock compares them. If at any point the two numbers differ, the lock detects this and jumps into an inescapable failure loop, where it resets the CPU and PPU once per second indefinitely. The only way to escape this loop is by resetting the lock chip itself, and the only way that you can do that is by hard resetting or rebooting the NES. If you played games on a front-loading NES, then it's extremely likely that you've actually seen this before. Ever slide a game in and turn the power on only to have the console just sit there and blink at you? Yeah, that's the CIC lockout chip on the NES, entering and executing that failure loop. Most of the time, this is caused by a faulty electrical connection between the lock and the key, by way of a corroded pad on the game's PCB or a loose cartridge connector. As far as the tech is concerned, that's pretty much it. Outside of some esoteric aspects like specific chip models, what I just described is how the 10NES system and the CIC lockout chips work. But where there's a lock, there's usually someone who wants to pick that lock, and no video about the CIC would be complete without taking a peek at some of the ways that people have circumvented it in the past. Now, as far as I know, there are two basic approaches when it comes to circumventing the system. The first way is to disable the lock chip on the NES, which is something you can pretty easily do yourself, but I'm going to save that whole process for another video. The other way is to produce your own key chip capable of tricking the lock into thinking that the cart is authentic. Any such chip would need to produce the correct sequence that the lock was expecting at the exact right time. Thankfully, there are only 16 possible binary streams of finite length. This is because those streams are composed of pseudo-random binary numbers, and there are only 16 possible seeds for the random number generator that produces them. The details of pseudo-random number generation are way outside of scope for this video, but I'm hoping to make an episode on the topic in the future. Anyway, if you can record each of the 16 sequences and produce your own chip that spits them out at the right time, then you can trick the lock and effectively bypass the system. And this is exactly what Atari tried to do like the minute the NES hit the store shelves back in 86. My best guess is that Atari was primarily motivated by the desire to produce more than three games a year, which again was that limit that Nintendo imposed as part of the license agreement. But you also have to take into account that 10NES gave Nintendo complete control over the kind of games that could be published. Finally, don't discount that licensing fee. I imagine Atari wanted to avoid paying that as well. Unfortunately, after what was probably a whole lot of tedious work involving oscilloscopes and the like, Atari engineers failed to determine the exact sequence of ones and zeros that were being produced by the chips. Not a company to be deterred, they next tried opening the cases of the CIC chips to see if they could stain, photograph, and record the ones and zeros encoded on the silicon of the chip's program ROM. If they could do that, then it would be relatively easy to disassemble the binary code and end up with the chip's program. With the code in hand, it would only be a matter of figuring out what the program did and writing their own to do the same thing. But again, Atari's engineers were not up to the task, and they were unable to obtain the ROM code this way. It was at this point that the company decided to take a different approach. Okay, so in the United States, computer code can be patented, copyrighted, and considered a trade secret. But when you officially copyright something, you generally have to give the Copyright Office the entirety of the work. 
Otherwise, it's hard for the court to uphold your rights in the case of an infringement. Now, I'm no IP lawyer, so take this all with a grain of salt, but when the source code can also be considered a trade secret, like the CIC's program ROM, there's a way to file the copyright such that the listing is not immediately available to the public upon request. Apparently, in order to get the full contents of the listing, you need to convince the copyright office that you have a valid legal reason that you need to see it. So this was the way that Nintendo filed their copyright for the CIC code, and it's also apparently the way that Atari got a hold of it. According to information that would come out years later, Atari's lawyers fabricated court documents for a fictitious lawsuit between Atari and Nintendo that revolved around a copyright claim on the CIC. They then sent these documents to the United States Copyright Office, claiming that they needed to see the source code for the chip so that they could properly defend themselves. Shortly after that, the Copyright Office sent Atari a complete copy of Nintendo's listing, which of course included the CIC's full source code. I want to be 100% crystal clear about all this. What Atari's lawyers did with the fake court documents and the like? Yeah, that's called fraud. They committed fraud against the United States government. Unsurprisingly, Atari quickly produced their own workaround chip that circumvented the 10NES system. They called the chip Rabbit, and in 1989, they used it to release 11 very much unlicensed NES games. For those of you keeping score at home, that's eight more games than Nintendo was cool with. Seeing this, Nintendo responded by immediately suing Atari for copyright and patent infringement. It was during this lawsuit that all of Atari's shenanigans came to light, and apparently they even copied the exact CIC code that handled communication between the chips. Another interesting thing to come out of the lawsuit was that Nintendo's 10NES patent would probably be deemed obvious, as it was nearly identical to another patent that was filed almost exactly a year earlier by Bell Labs. The only thing that Nintendo did differently was to make use of a reset bus to lock the system out. But at that time, the use of reset buses was really common, so it meant Nintendo wasn't really doing anything truly novel. The 10 Gen Rabbit chip was only one example of 10 NES circumvention. Other companies were able to get around the system by producing circuits that interrupted the function of the lock chip on the NES. From what I read, this had something to do with sending voltage spikes to the lock that caused the SM590 processor to freeze up during execution. But I'm honestly not 100% sure how that all works, so I'm not really going to touch it. Atari and Nintendo eventually settled the lawsuit out of court in 1994, and the last NES game, an unlicensed game called F22, was published in 1997. By the mid-2000s, the console was widely considered a relic, and there was very little commercial motivation to continue work on circumventing the 10NES lockout system. But that didn't mean that the work had stopped, because in a quiet corner of the internet, there existed the NES development community. And within that community, there were a handful of dedicated hobbyists who were hard at work unlocking the secrets of the CIC. Their story is a pretty awesome one, and it's told via page after page of posts on the NestDev forums. I considered boiling those posts down and presenting the overall narrative here, but I kind of want to talk to some of the folks involved before I do that. One, because I don't even know if they want their work presented in this way, and two, because I don't fully understand some of the details of how they did what they did. And what they did was to use roughly the same techniques that Atari had failed to use on the CIC, but instead used them on the 10 Gen Rabbit chip and succeeded. I suggest going through and reading these posts. The work is extremely impressive. Without it and some more recent work on the official CIC chips, this video would have been incredibly difficult to research and produce. So, what I'm trying to say here is this. To those community members who were involved and did such great work, thank you. Hopefully I was able to distill some of your hard-earned information and communicate it in a way that makes it easy for others to understand. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next video on the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.